Hello everyone, this is Take from BigHeadTaco.com and welcome to PhD Studios. I'm here to announce the brand new Fujifilm X Pro 3. So let's start my first impressions now. So the first thing you're going to notice is the finish. And this is, uh, there's three finishes, the top two tier finishes with the Duratec technology. You're going to pay a little premium for, but this is the Dura Silver. So it's the closest you're going to get to uh, a true titanium unfinished look, but this does have a coating on it. But uh, let's talk a little bit about the history of the X-Pro. The original X-Pro one came out in January of 2012. And then four years later, which is a long time, the X-Pro 2 was released in January of 2016. And now we are in October of 2019. So if you waited till January of 2020, it would have been evenly another four years of ours. So it came out a little bit earlier than uh, the previous gap, but still, uh, because of the flagship status, they don't replace this camera that often. Uh, as I mentioned, there's going to be three finishes. The first one is, they call it half black, but it's just like a basic black paint finish on top of the top and bottom plate titanium and the Dura Silver which is the one you see here right now. Um, this is a pre-production unit so there's going to be a little bit of a, a fit and finish. Uh, the finish, the Dura Silver does take uh, like you can see fingerprints on it easier. So sometimes you, it might look like a haze, but it's just my dirty little fingers all over this beautiful camera. And there is a, a Dura Black, which kind of reminds me of the X-Pro 2 graphite, which I have a copy of here. So it reminds me of this look, but I haven't seen it in person, so I can't tell you for sure what it looks like. But I thought the Dura... Uh, Silver looks the best because it is the closest uh, to titanium. So I do have a, a Nikon 35 Ti. The Ti is the the scientific uh, symbol for titanium. And so you can see here the finish is pretty darn, pretty darn similar, right? You can sort of see that. They're very, very close in finish. So that's why I kind of wanted to see this. And if you are a kind of a, someone who likes exotic materials on your watches, this is not an exotic material, but on your watches or, or anything like that, this is a pretty exotic in, in today's standards because not a lot of brands put titanium on their cameras anymore. But Fujifilm has always kind of been a color company, meaning they make chemistry, they make uh, f uh, photographic film, they make uh, uh, cosmetics. And that makes sense because they're all about color. And so Fujifilm is very aware of coloring the products. You think of a brand like Sony, uh, they don't really come up with multiple colors like uh, like titanium and graphite. And I have other Fujifilm cameras here. You know, they really care about how a camera looks. And for those of you that are just more about practical, like who cares how my axe or my butcher knife looks like, you know, I just want it to cut, then then a brand like Sony is great. But those of us that do like, uh, you know, beautiful finishes, nice aesthetics and design, then Fujifilm and Leica are probably the two brands that you're probably most attracted to. But this finish is fantastic. Now, there is going to be a price premium, as I may have mentioned, uh, $17.99 US or $23.99 Canadian for the, the standard black finish and $19.99 US or $26.99 Canadian for the Dura Silver, which is this one here, or the Dura Black. And so US pricing under $2,000 for the premium two finishes on the X-Pro3. So I think that is uh, about what people expected. I thought it'd be a little bit more expensive, um, but uh, I think that's great. And as well, just remember that it is, the titanium is the top and the bottom plate. It's not the entire camera. The internal chassis is going to be magnesium alloy, as was the X-Pro2 and the other cameras, but just the top and bottom plate. Billy did say that they did consider brass, which would have been awesome because like cameras use top and bottom brass plate. Uh, it wears nicely, especially when the paint starts coming off, hence the term brassing. But Billy said that um, the weight was too much because brass is not that uh, is not that light. And so uh, I think titanium was a great option to use. And um, in terms of weight, it is 447 grams dry, meaning no battery, no memory card, or just under 500 grams, uh, 497 with the battery and memory cards. And uh, that's 
a pretty good feed. It's a little bit, I think it's 445 was the previous X-Pro 2 weight dry. And considering that they were able to put this, uh, this articulating hiding articulating LCD screen, I think they did a pretty darn good job. It is slightly thicker than the X Pro 2, but it's not noticeable. I think it's like two millimeters thicker, but pretty much they did not make this significantly thicker to put a articulating screen, which I think is an engineering feat. So what's changed from the X Pro 3 from the X Pro 2. Well, from the outside, it doesn't look like there is a lot of changes. Uh, chassis wise, it looks like they pretty much use the same chassis. There's a few slight changes. Um, this, uh, as I mentioned again, this is an early pre production copy, uh, but uh, most of the major you know, bits that should be here are here. Uh, both the cart slots now on the X uh, Pro 2 is. I mean, X-Pro 3 is the uh, the ultra high speed card type 2 compliant. The previous X-Pro, also the door opens a little different. This thing had that kind of a slide out and open. And the X-Pro X -Pro 3 has more of this little door that kind of springs open, which I actually like this design better. But both are the UHS type 2. Um, USB type C connector here. Can you see that? USB type C connector here. Um, so it could be used for both uh, data transfer. It can be used for powering, which you can sort of adjust inside the custom features, as well as uh, like the XT30, you can use it as a headphone jack. So they've utilized probably as much as they could out of that one jack. The 2.5 millimeter is the same, uh, the input for microphone as the X Pro 2. So clearly they don't really want you to uh, use Use this for video. They do give you most of the video features, uh, but uh, if they really wanted you to shoot video, they would have put a 3.5. So this is not a primarily a video camera, although you can shoot video, and uh, we'll talk about that just a little bit later. But this door is kind of this rubberized door. It's no longer that strong kind of hinge door, which maybe had an opportunity to break off. This is less likely to break off, but it just feels a little flimsy. I do prefer that solid door, but that's the new side door here. Um, I don't see a PC sync terminal. The previous one had one here. Now I'll correct it in this video if uh, it does have one, but this pre-production just didn't happen to have it. But that's what the PC sync terminal should be right here, but the door positioning has changed. This door, as you can see, it's a little bit higher because of that sync terminal isn't there. As well, they did redo the eyepiece. The previous eyepiece, there was a kind of a rubberized uh, thing around here and that would come off and you actually have to send it back to Fujifilm for them to replace that. And so one of the first things one of my X-Pro2 uh, colleagues wanted to look at was this and it is now kind of a hard, solid piece here, it doesn't come off, it's not rubbery, but it's still not as nice as kind of a, a cup, uh, kind of a cupped eyepiece that you would get on uh, the X-T3 or the X-H1. So I think this is okay, but it is a, it is a bigger uh, EVF, so much easier to see through. Um, Hardware-wise, it is using the same processor and sensor as the X-T3 and the X-T30. It's the X-Trans uh, 26 megapixel CMOS uh, backside illuminated sensor with copper wiring, X-Processor 4. Uh, so it has all the speed uh, and function uh, possibilities as the X-T3 and the X-T30, except for perhaps some hardware uh, limitations on the X-Pro uh, X Pro 3. It has Bluetooth 4.2 as well as Wi-Fi, so you can do all the Bluetoothy things, which is great because you know you can pair this to your smartphone, and it does time, date, and that kind of stuff, and even GPS locator. So that's actually great if you're out shooting and you want to know where you took your photos. Um, there is no longer a dedicated delete button. It basically shares the drive button with the delete button, which makes sense because when you are shooting, this is a drive mode, and then when you're looking at your photos in the playback mode, then this just becomes a delete. So it's one less button, one less hole in the metal top, and so you get a little bit more titanium. And one of the things I kind of thought about just kind of as a joke is that now there's a huge space that you can actually put a little sticker in here. So if you if you want to put your, um, I don't know, your, your band name or you want to inscribe your name in here or put a picture of your loved one in here, you can here and then bang and you can customize it now, right? You don't have to put a sticker on the outside, you just put it 
on the inside. So I thought that was, uh, that can be cool or maybe it's just dumb and you don't want to do anything like that. But I just thought about that. Uh, but no delete button. Uh, the uh, new shutter mechanism, Fujifilm, kind of made a, a big deal about it. Um, I It definitely feels different than the X-Pro2. Uh, X-Pro2 has a more clear when you are uh, pressing the shutter button. Um, it's just half press is easier to get to. Even the sound. You hear that, and then this one here, can you hear the difference? And it's kind of softer and kind of mushier, if I can call it mushy, until you get to the bottom, and then when you press down, it's more purposeful. The Fujifilm kind of made a big deal about that shutter, so we'll talk about that a little bit later. So uh, those are kind of the, the, the main physical, maybe I should even, should I even have the X-Pro2 kind of here as well? So th those are the main differences uh, physically on the outside as well as internally. And so now let's go over what's new with the brand new Fujifilm X-Pro3. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the titanium that is on the uh, X-Pro3. Uh, again, it's the top and bottom plate that is titanium. The internals, the chassis is uh, made out of magnesium. Three different finishes. The top two, so all three have titanium. The top two have this Duratec uh, technology. It actually is a trademark name that Fujifilm uh, has. Uh, it's called, it's some kind of a cold plasma uh, technology. It's a hard scratch resistant uh, coating. Um, but as I mentioned, it does leave fingerprints. Uh, in the video, I'm not going to do it, but I was in a conference video with uh, Billy uh, Luong from Fujifilm Canada and he got like a, an Ulfa blade and he was scratch doing like a scratch test or like Jerry rigs everything on the, the titanium black and then on the Duratec finish on both the, the silver and the Duratec black and no scratches on this. Um, you can even like Kind of even scratch you can even see the scratch but then it just kind of comes off what's actually happening is that my nail is being filed down by this finish and that's how strong this finish is as well uh, fujifilm is now calling this uh viewfinder uh well i think maybe they always have but they use the acronym hvf or hybrid viewfinder instead of OVF EVF. And that's what I always said, OVF EVF hybrid viewfinder. So this HVF has been improved. It's a 0.5 times OVF with the new 3.69 million dot EVF. And so that is equal to the X Pro, uh, sorry, the X-H1 and the X-T3. It has the, the high speed 100 frames per second refresh. So looking through it in some scenes, you're like, wow. Uh, and that's, sorry, that's in boost mode. Uh, you're like, wow, it almost, it looks so real when you're in that mode. And Billy did say that that was one of the reasons why there was a delay on the X-Pro3 because, you know, nobody stock makes a 3.69 million EVF that, sh that moves, uh, out of the way for the EVF, this hybrid viewfinder. You can even sort of see here as I switch it from. That's the EVF. Now the EVF moves out of the way and that's the OVF. And then if you press this in, you get the little mini, can you see that little mini EVF in the corner there? Kind of pops up. And so this is a very complex system that Fujifilm has invented and nobody else makes this. So Fujifilm has developed that. So it's a very high quality moving uh, electronic viewfinder so it's a very cool feature I'm not sure how many people will use the OVF but this is their flagship shooters camera and that pretty much is what makes uh, this camera unique from anybody else and so uh, that has been upgraded uh, the, the big thing the big controversy is probably this uh, this unique 180 degree uh, touch LCD screen with 1.62 million pixels uh, and on the back of it has this e-ink sub monitor and um, you can see that uh, it looks like a, um, a film box. I do have it in the classic. Can you see that? I'm going to just try to move it in a way you can see it. So it's a classic um, negative. It's a new film profile. I really like it. Um, maybe I'll embed a picture now. But I'll share more uh, photos in my shooting review. But I like this 
kind of it's, it's kind of neat it is not backlit it is e-ink and you can make this look more like the top panel of the xh1 where you just you have just the basic shooting features like shutter speed aperture battery power that kind of stuff i wish this actually it has white balance and the film you're using and the iso uh the iso speed you're at but it doesn't so it really looks like a film box but it doesn't give you battery power and i wish it does but when you're shooting at night in the dark you cannot see this because this is not backlit and when you turn the camera this camera is actually off and turn it on or off that stays there and for those of you who don't really know what I'm talking about those of you that are older will know but here it's like some of the older film cameras this is an old uh, rangefinder I have and they have these little little spaces in the back because when you put a roll of film in here you have to know what ISO speed you had and so I you know here's here's a box of, of uh, Fuji film right here the uh, Pro 400 so that's the Pro Neg uh, uh, film simulation in here is similar to this and uh, I do happen to have a, a a box that I've already opened and I put in one of my cameras. In fact, it might even be in in here. Uh, and see, this is the the tail end of the box, right? So basically, what you do is you you tear this. Uh, just make sure I don't tear it the wrong way. But you tear this off like this, and then you just slip it in the back. You see that? And this is just to remind you. And they're just here. Ugh. There you go. So now, now it's in there, and now you know you are shooting this film. And so this is kind of, can you see that? There you go. And you see this? There you go. You see? That's that's what Fujifilm is doing. So it's kind of a, a neat idea. It, it might seem a little gimmicky, but but like, as I mentioned, you can change this over to the basic shooting info of shutter speed, aperture, and you can design. So this is considered the classic view, and you can go to the regular view where you can see all your main specs. So instead of uh, having the LCD showing the the um, your main uh, specs that you have, you could just look at this back. But again, it is not backlit. If you're in a situation where backlighting is not good uh, meaning you know you're indoors and it's a, like a concert hall and you want to blind your neighbors this might be a better thing because now you're hiding the LCD as well and you can look at everything through the EVF but uh, I, I think it's really cool and so there you go something like that as for the titanium metal itself, some may be wondering, you know, why use titanium? Uh, it used to be called the space age metal. And as I showed previously, uh, a lot of premium compact point shoots, the Nikon 35Ti, the 28Ti was black, but it was titanium uh, underneath that paint. Uh, the F3T, the Minolta TC1, the Contax T series, they all with the T, uh, they all, you know, they were, they were made out of titanium. And it, is a kind of a unique metal. Uh, Fujifilm says it's 55% the weight of stainless steel, but still stronger than stainless steel, and it has strong corrosion resistance. So it's even resistant to uh, corrosion with seawater and chlorine. So it's low density, it's strong, lustrous, and corrosion free. So that's why Fujifilm decided to use this exotic metal. But on top of that, as I mentioned, they put that Duratec technology, which is awesome. Now going back, we've been talking about this little sub monitor, but going back to this LCD, now this was a weird one for a lot of people, and at first people criticized it. Because, and even I was skeptical, thinking why why on earth would you create a, uh, maybe I just move this box a little way from here on, uh, you know, why, why, why have, um, why have it like this? Well, one of the reasons is because they wanted to keep this as flat and flush as possible. And to do that, the only way they can do that was to have it hinge this way. But I actually noticed that when I was shooting, you can actually, well, it's kind of funny. It creates like a table here, but you can really shoot straight down better than you can with some of the other uh, Fujifilm cameras with articulation screen. Like this here, this is the X-H, uh, X-H1. And X-H1, if you, can you see that this, this EVF uh, here actually gets in the way of shooting this way. And so if you shoot straight down like this, and let's just say you're doing a YouTube video like I am right now, I'm using the X-T3, this actually is in your way. And when you use the X, when you use the X, um, Pro two, uh, X Pro 3, uh, not a lot of people will shoot in a way where you're shooting straight down. See that, you have a clear view of the entire LCD screen. So shooting straight down, you have a clear view. Uh, if you're shooting overhead, you can shoot overhead like this. So you're looking straight up at this. Um, you can shoot uh, sh straight forward this way, but again, now the, the EVF is down, uh, sorry, the LCD is down here. So it's in, a, it's in a very unusual spot. 
But after a while, you, you do get used to shooting it down here. If you shoot with your screen a lot, your back screen, so if you're shooting, you're always, other than the articulation here, that you're always shooting off the back of your screen, um, you're gonna be always shooting like this. And maybe this is just not ideal for you. But I do like, it says 180 degree, but I mean, you're only gonna use it from 90 to 180, right? So really functionally, you're using it from here to here, um, and you get a protection in the back. And, and one of the things that you get out of a camera like this is that you don't chimp. So you don't always take a picture and immediately look at what you shot. And I found that even for myself, you know, I, I'm a film shooter. I shoot a lot of film and with film, obviously you can't chimp. And even for me, the temptation is always there to chimp. So to have it this way, uh, I found when I was shooting, it worked out well. Um, when I reviewed the Leica MD, which was the one of the first digital cameras that not only didn't have an LCD, but it uses an OVF. And so there was no way of actually viewing your images in camera. And people thought that was insane. And a lot of people criticized me when I reviewed that video. But when people actually shot with it, they actually thought after, they rethought the whole thing and, and realized that how great it was for keeping you in the moment and not focusing so much on what you just shot, but you're looking for the next shot. And I did find that with this camera, that shooting, that I was looking for the next shot and also just feeling more protected. Some brand is probably gonna create a mini sub monitor screen uh, for this camera. But other than that, I feel pretty safe that this is not going to be damaged in any way. Another thing that Fujifilm uh, talked about was the, the re-design um, of this uh, shutter, this new, um, leaf, uh, new leaf spring shutter design. And so you'll have to kind of play with it to see if you prefer it. I felt that it was too long of a travel, but then once you get to the halfway point, you have to add a little bit more tension and then you can press it. And as I, here, I'll put it right up to the microphone here. So that's, that's the sound you get. Maybe I should have done it with something here. So this is the X-Pro3. And now this will be the X-Pro2. So it does sound quite different, more muffled than the X-Pro3. And uh, the sound is better, but what I would do is if you can just get a little soft uh, shutter release because this still is threaded. The main reason for the thread here is of course not to put one of these things on but to, if you wanted to put this on a tripod and you just use a little uh, physical remote release on this so you wouldn't get any uh, shutter shake and uh, have it more stable but I found this adds just enough torque that now I don't feel that and some photographers even like to shoot like this to add a little bit more torque but uh, I would recommend this if you don't like that shutter feel, but it does have a more muffled uh, sound to the shutter, which I actually like. For autofocus, even though it uh, has the same processor as the X-T3 and the X-T30, it does uh, have a, a new algorithm. Um, we don't know if it's gonna be pushed, it probably will be pushed to the X-T3 at least, but this new algorithm allows for the autofocus to get down to EV minus six. So in low light, it uh, does really well. And I've tested it and it definitely, I actually spent a lot of time shooting at night and autofocus just catches on. The X-T3 already was great, but with this new algorithm, EV minus six, and that worked out really well for me. Uh, going back to the uh, EVF on the uh, X uh, Pro 3, even though it's this hybrid, this HVF that Fujifilm has, the EVF itself has actually been improved. Uh, one of the things is the, the, the contrast. The X-Pro2 and the X-T3 has a contrast ratio of 1 to 300. Uh, the X-T, X-Pro3 has a contrast ratio of 1 to 5,000. That's quite a significant improvement on contrast ratio, as well as brightness, and as well as the wide color space in sRGB, it's a 97% coverage. So with that 3.69 million dot, one to 5,000 high contrast ratio, and the wide color space in sRGB, 97% uh, coverage, you're getting a, a very beautiful, and, and also, sorry, the high refresh rate as well as 100 uh, FPS on this when you're in the boost mode, you're getting a really nice shooting experience. And that's probably another reason why Fujifilm is really emphasizing the EVF experience in this versus 
versus uh, you know spending too much time looking at the back of this screen. Now let's talk about the two new, well really it's one new color film uh, simulation. It is the, um, the classic negative which I spent I think that's pretty much all I've been shooting in because I, I know what the other film simulation looks like. I did do some bracketing shots, but I really like uh, the classic negative. Some photographers mentioned that they prefer the classic chrome, the little bit more muted colors, that they found that the classic neg was a little bit too punchy, but I like that punchiness. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's based on Superior 100, and it has that kind of that nostalgic film look. It's probably the most, Fujifilm said it's the most film-like film digital film simulation and if anyone can pull that off it would be Fujifilm because you know they still currently make film so they know what film should look like and so for them to create a digital version of a long discontinued film so even Eternal was a cinematic film classic chrome is kind of based on quarter chrome and then you know Provia, Sensia, uh, Velvia those are actual Fuji film films and this as well uh, classic Neg is based on Superior 100 and it has that film type look but as well they do have the uh, the ability to shift colors for black and white and not just warm and cool but as well as uh, between magenta and green so you can really fine tune your black white images and as well you can do uh, not only color chrome effect which kind of gives you a wider range of red yellows and greens what was missing was in the uh, the blue range so now there is a new color chrome effects blue which increases the 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 uh, range of tones available for rendering blue so if you do both of those color chrome effect and color chrome effect blue now you're getting kind of way wider color gamut and you can use that coupled with any of the film simulations so I think that's great as well you can do a lot more um, in camera adjusting so not only can you do tone curves for both stills and video but you can also do clarity control so a lot of things you can do in camera and these things you can adjust even when you're in uh, the raw conversion within the camera and when you output you can actually output to a TIFF and you get these insanely huge files but one of the advantages is that from the so from in camera you create instead of creating a JPEG you create an in camera TIFF and you just kind of use your little alchemy of all the different color chrome effects and tone curves and clarity, uh, the exposure, white balance, and then as you export it, instead of creating a small JPEG, you're creating a TIFF file, and with that TIFF file, you can then export it to your iPad or your computer, and then go straight into Lightroom or Photoshop and work on this really large file. So it's almost like you're still retaining your raw negative, but it's, it's a workable file. So that's one of the advantages, and again, and that might be something that they'll push to the X-T3 in the future. Another thing that Fujifilm was able to do is that they actually uh, were able to, in the, the mount adapter, they now allow you to name uh, the different um, uh, the lenses you have. So if you're consistently using a certain vintage lens, you know that you can change a lot of things. You can change the vignetting, the coloring, um, uh, as well as the distortion. And then I thought you could actually name it. So you could just quickly grab it, tune that, uh, uh, that, um, that particular lens. And then again, you can fine tune, uh, your, your, the film simulation. And now you have a real customized look to your digital images. A couple other things you could do um, internally is that you can do now focus bracketing, which is cool. You can even focus on near and far and let the camera automatically decide on what to bracket. As well, you could do uh, inter uh, interval timer shooting, exposure smoothing. So you can't do internal time lapse, but as you export, it does smoothen out between each frame. And as well. For multiple exposure, you can go up to nine frames multiple exposure. If you'd like doing that kind of stuff, you're a landscape photographer, you can do this additive type or you know you can uh, figure out exactly how it it, it, it um, combines all the images as well as HDR where it takes uh, three photos and combines them and you can also customize that. And so all these things you could do in camera, which is great. Finally, uh, one of the big things is that um, uh, internally, and again, it might be pushed over to the other cameras is, um, it's not really a big thing, but uh, in the Q menu, you can actually just choose, I'm gonna just see if I can even show you guys here. Um, so in the Q mode, you can see here, it only has eight. So you can pick between uh, 16, 12, eight, and four. So let me actually, let's just go in here. Let's just go into um, custom settings. 
um, button dial settings, Q, here we go, menu here, so you can see that there, between 16, 12, 8, or 4 items, that's a new feature, again, that can definitely be pushed to, uh, to the X-T3 as well. And so, let's now finish up by talking about who, uh, where does this camera belong within the ecosystem, and who this camera's for. So here I have uh, the old X-Pro2 in the Graphite uh, finish beautiful camera with a matching 23 f2 the new X Pro 3 now these cameras here like the X Pro series the X 100 series these are Fujifilm they would consider shooters cameras people that want a good kind of a shooting experience not just about the functions and the focus speed and that kind of thing but really enjoy shooting and I know a lot of professionals let's just say they're Nikon Canon DSLR sports shooters and they want a, a very functional tool to get the job done but on vacation and on their free time many of them actually have an X100 because of that that uh, shooting um, sort of experience that is just enjoyable to take pictures. This is the X100F, by the way, in the limited edition brown uh, faux leather. Um, so the X Pro has always been that way. Fujifilm wants to focus on the shooting experience. Now, something like the X-H1 uh, is uh, very different. This has IBIS and it has more of a DSLR type form function, although it does have the dials that's very well known for Fujifilm and it's very ergonomic and it works well. Uh, the shutter works very nicely. It's very dampened and quiet, uh, but you know, look at how big that grip is. And it's kind of an ugly, it's kind of pretty but ugly camera. And I would, uh, you know, as a hybrid shooter, this is probably Fujifilm's best camera. And right now I'm shooting this video on the X-T3. So the X-H series, the X-T3 series that I'm shooting on, and the X-Pro series, all, all, all three of them are flagships and each one of them are focused on a different type of photographer. So the X-T3 kind of lands in between these two. It has sort of a, a retro vibe to it but very functional has the latest processor sensor as does the X-Pro3 the X-H2 will eventually catch up and get that as well but um, this is for a hybrid shooter who needs IBIS and a professional that you know wants the the top features uh, that Fujifilm can offer the X-T3 is kind of in the middle it's for someone who wants to be able to do everything can do stills as well as video quite well the X-Pro3 is a shooter's camera so if you are I, I think the target market really is like a shooters those that care about form materials that are used to build it and as well as the style that this camera offers. And as I was mentioning about Fujifilm and their colors, I mean, other than the X-H uh, series, let's pull that out of the way. I mean, I just brought in uh, the Instax camera, and here is uh, the X-F100 here. It has a bit of a champagne kind of a tone to it versus the X-100F, uh, kind of more of a silver finish, chrome finish. And here's this new uh, Instax. Uh, mini lie play i like I, I like to call it little play but uh, you know with that kind of that copper finish on black and it has a nice texture to it see fujifilm really cares a lot about not only form but as well as the color and if you think of cars how boring would it be if a car only came in one color right i mean a car's main function is to get you from a to b there's a bit of driving experience but the color of the car does not affect your driving experience because really you don't really see the color of the car while you're driving right but yet people care a lot about how a car looks and this is an old i've showcased this on a lot of different uh, uh different videos but it is the older uh medium format fujifilm camera the ga645zi it has a slight champagne kind of finish it actually looks a lot like titane doesn't it but this came in uh, different colors, including more of a, a graphite color, and I think it was Japan only, as well as this kind of a champagne silver color. Looks a lot like titanium, but it is not titanium. But you can see for years now, Fujifilm has been consistent that they, they build very beautiful, functional cameras, but the form is very important to them, as well as the colors that they use to... Um, uh, to 
to finish their cameras. And even now that they use this, this more exotic finish, I think a lot of photographers will enjoy this, especially as I mentioned, uh, Leica shooters. And so um, by expanding the shooting experience in camera, and you could do TIFF, you could do uh, clarity, you can do your tone curves, you have various film simulations and uh, HDR, as well as the, the focus limiter. I'm not sure if I talked about that, but it has two different presets. So you can sort of do scale zone focusing with this. Uh, and um, I tried it, great for street, especially if you have a limited, uh, 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 like a lens that focuses too far and you just wanna limit it to something that you're actually shooting, like if you're doing macro photography, you, you could do all that settings in here. And again, that might be pushed over to the X-T3 because it's kind of a software thing, but all these things are done in camera to make your shooting experience more enjoyable. So I think that's really what the X-Pro3 is about. So thanks for watching my video, guys. Again, the X-Pro3, $17.99 US, for the half black finish, $19.99 US for the Dura Silver, which is this one here, and the Dura Black finish. Weight, basically the same as the previous X-Pro2. The size, basically the same. What's really changed is this articulating uh, LCD screen that goes back, the mini sub-monitor, a vastly improved hybrid viewfinder with a 3.69 million dot, 100 frames per second, uh, EVF with the 1 to 5,000 contrast ratio from the previous 1 to 300, as well as a wider uh, color range in the sRGB. So your shooting experience is going to be great using the EVF, which is kind of basically what Fujifilm wants you to do, as well as the OVF. And then at times you can use this kind of down low like this for shooting like a waist level finder. But as I found myself too, uh, you can do some pretty cool things with this, even really weird kind of shooting angles. So I had a great time shooting with this. Wait for my shooting review of this camera, but uh, I think this camera is going to be a hit with the X processor 4 and the new 26 megapixel uh, backside illuminated CMOS sensor as the X-T3. This can keep up with a lot of what the X-T3 can do. And with the sort of size and the design language of this, um, carrying this around, I had a lot of people just thinking I had a film camera and uh, this just feels really nice in the hand. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that Billy did say that Fujifilm actually did rebalance the weight of this camera kind of more to your right heavy so it, it, it feels more balanced and you know those are those little things those little subtle things that Fujifilm thinks of to make this camera a shooter's camera and uh, it's those subtle things that we know um, you know as other brands focus on autofocus speed and and you know higher megapixels uh, Fujifilm has that right with the GFX series but on a camera like this in its third iteration they're now focused on premium materials uh, for function as well as for form because it looks beautiful, but as well, little things like making sure that this stays as thin as possible, creating this unique kind of this hinged LCD back with a rear sub monitor, having, um, you know, they're removing the D-pad, which to me, I don't miss because I, with the XE3, I got used to just using the uh, joystick for going through the menus. And really, once you set up the camera the way you want to shoot it, you, I rarely jump into the menus anyways. And so that kind of, that shooting experience that maybe on, the only other brand that does that just as well is Leica. And like Fujifilm, Leica also has limited edition colors. And when they came out with the M10, P, it was a very slight change in the shutter, and even from the M10, it made it a little bit thinner. And for people who aren't into light, because they're like, wow, you know, why are they going so crazy over making the camera a little bit thinner and changing the shutter sound and things like that? Well, you know, after, you know, you just, chasing after specs and, and speed, you kind of get tired of it because as a photographer, it's not just a technical thing, but it's also an artistic uh, pursuit. And you know, as a shooter of an X-Pro2, you will immediately feel the small little changes and differences to make this a better camera. So I'm looking forward to shooting with this longer. Look for my shooting review soon. Thank you so much Fujifilm Canada for sending me an early copy. Again, this is a pre-production copy, guys. So um, for the little blemishes, or whatever you see here, um, wait for my production copy before I do a, a full uh, review on this camera. But the images are beautiful, uh, the ergonomics, the function, the style is beautiful. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys shooting with it and let me know what you think. So thanks for watching and happy shooting.
Wow, that's fast. Thanks for watching, guys. Happy shooting.